If you want to find your purpose, look at where you struggle. Embrace your fuck ups. Embrace those mistakes. Embrace those I wish I had a do over. I could have done it different. Nah, don't let your brain go there. Just ask yourself, what do I need to learn from? People will say to me, Robert, you know, you, you've, got, you've got a purpose. You're living with passion. You've written a book. You're changing the world. You know, you, you decided where you wanted to live. You've got a great life. And, you know, how can I find that kind of purpose and passion? And um, honestly, I've never asked myself, what is my purpose? I never have. But guys all the time ask me, how do you find purpose? They go, you're living with purpose. I am, but I've never asked myself, what's my, what's my purpose? But what I've done, I've, kind of looking back on my life, what I've done is every time I've struggled with something, struggled in a relationship, um, struggled financially, struggled to, to learn how to meet women when I became single, everything I've ever struggled with, in a sense, has become my purpose, right? I, 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 don't, like, I, I don't like not knowing how to do something. I don't like doing what I do and it not work very well. Anybody else like that? So I've never had to ask what's my purpose. I've just always tried to figure out why shit wasn't working in my life. And because I'm a communicator by nature, both writing and speaking, that's just what I do. I've just communicated about what I've struggled with. No More Mr. Nice Guy is about my struggles. Dating Essentials for Men, my second book, is about what I've struggled with. And I just happened to write those struggles down along with some stuff that I learned. So I'll just kind of throw this out as a freebie. If you want to find your purpose, look at where you struggle. Dive into your struggles. You'll find purpose in that. Anybody familiar with Mark Manson? Some of you have read Mark Manson's books. I uh, wrote uh, Models and then The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. And then his most recent one, I think everything is fucked. Yeah. People used to ask me all the time, do you know Mark Manson? And, and I did not. Um, and, and, and people would say, well, he, he quotes you in his book and in, in models. That's back before Subtle Art of Giving a Fuck had come out. And I was, you know, he and I actually have had some email contact, but I, I never knew what he said about me in the book Models. Mm -hmm. Well, I got really sick two years ago. Two years ago at this time, I was really sick. Um, dying and nobody could figure out why so i i, I just I stomach cramps all the time no energy so i slept a lot and i read a lot i thought well fuck it i'm gonna read models and find out what mark manson said about me you know that's what you do when you're dying right <laughs> so um so I, i'm reading it. it's a good book i mean it's a good book. it's about, about being authentic that's what all this stuff's about about being authentic and it wasn't until the epilogue right he finishes the book, and in the epilogue, he mentions my book, and, and he said that, that he thinks No More Mr. Nice Guy is, 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 you know, a great book that every man should read, and I'm paraphrasing him, and he said, in, and a part he took from it was seeing everything as a gift. What if it was a gift? And, um, and that had a big impact on him. He told a story about a tragedy that happened in his life and how he turned it into a gift and probably helped make him who he is today. So what if your struggles were a gift. What if the struggle you're having with the woman you're in a relationship with is a gift? What if you not knowing how to talk to women and get a date? What if that's a gift? What if uh, you not knowing what your purpose is, is a gift? What if whatever you struggle with is a gift, an opportunity, a chance to learn, and a chance to really dive into the depths of your purpose? And then I, I love what Mark shared. You know, and then give that to the world. Give it to the world. Whatever you guys are learning, give it back to the world. And I often say that No More Mr. Nice Guy is not a chronicle of my successes. It, it's, it's a list of my fuck-ups. It's everything that I, I got wrong and, and had to figure out why. Why is this not working? So embrace your fuck-ups. Embrace those mistakes. Embrace those, I wish I had a do-over. I could have done it different. Nah, don't let your brain go there. Just ask yourself, what do I need to learn from it? Why did you come this weekend? Let go of fear and shame. To let go of fear and shame. I'm going to write some of these things down.
Speakers, which color is the best one? Blue. The blue? Do they all suck? Usually they do at hotels. Oh, this works fine. Let go, fear and shame. Oh, the other thing you need to know as a public speaker is how much time you've got. How much time do I have up here today? What? You know, somebody just tell me when I got 10 minutes left. All right, when I got 10 minutes left, somebody shout out 10 minutes. Get about an hour a day, so All right. if you need a little more, a little less. <coughs> All right, I, I, I can take six a day if you'll give them to me. But right. I'll, I'll go now. Somebody just shout out 10 minutes. I won't worry about it. Okay, let go of fear and shame. Other hands. Why'd you come? What you just said, that last part, I can't. That's one sentence right there. You got one left. The part about uh, finding the purpose, and then all the shit falls together. Purpose. <laughs> yeah, right at you, man. Uh, Two sentences. I've been at this a long time. I'm still really bad at approaching. Can't approach. Approach. You came here to learn to approach. Y yeah. Okay. By the way, I don't teach approach. But I'll teach you. I'll, I'll, I'll teach you some cool stuff. <laughs> cool stuff. I'll teach you cool stuff. Okay. All right. Came to confront my mommy issues. Mommy issues. We can do some cool stuff around that too. <laughs> All right. Let me use this to tee something up. Um, before I got up to talk, Lynn, correct? Yeah. Asked me a question about my book. Two questions that I get asked most about No More Mr. Nice Guy. One is about what I meant, what does being monogamous to mother mean? Okay? And so that's, I get asked that a lot, so that, that's mommy issues. The other question that she asked is a common question, where I say the opposite of crazy is still crazy. And I have to admit, anybody here you don't doubt yourself. Anybody in 12-step programs have done 12-step programs? Okay. You, you know what I'm talking about, right? I stole that from 12-step programs. Is a, we'll talk about the opposite of crazy being crazy. And really all that means, and, and I don't know, I, I think that might even been something Einstein said, that if you're at one extreme of something, and that, that we're going to call that crazy because it, it doesn't work. Let's just say that. It just doesn't work. And what a lot of people do is they'll go, well, if this isn't working, I'll just do the opposite. I'll go to the other extreme. If being a nice guy doesn't work, I'll just be a fucking asshole. That works. Women go for assholes, right? So you're going to go from this extreme. So if you're reacting to this, if this is the place you're going to react to, and you go the opposite direction, you're still going to end up in a reactionary place, which is still crazy. I'm going to be the opposite of my father. Well, you, you can't really be the opposite from your father. You're more like him than you're different. But if dad was not a great dad for whatever reason, just trying to be the opposite means you're just being the opposite of, an, of a not great dad. It doesn't mean you're a great dad or a great human being. So just doing the opposite of something does not necessarily take you in the direction of sanity or in what works. So, that help? Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. I love being told I'm awesome. Okay. This side of the room. Two sentences. Why'd you come here? Accountability. Accountability. Mm. That's music to my ears. I'm a terrible speller, by the way. That's good. You got it. Yep. Okay. I remember when, when No More Mr. Nice Guy first came out, I, I got interviewed by... Uh, a lot of, you know, like networks and, you know, people like that. 2020 sent a film crew to, to video uh, like a three-hour workshop that I did. And I'm just sitting there thinking as I'm writing stuff on the whiteboard, if my sixth grade teacher, you know, uh, was watching it, she probably, she probably think, he always was such a nice boy and he never could spell. <laughs> um, accountability. We will probably do some accountability exercises this weekend. I, I, that's something I, I was thinking about. Um, I, I, I really do love what Mark talked about in terms of, of the masculine need for initiation. 
and and how it is just so lacking for us men. And uh, he and I have had some conversations about the search for tribe and the need for initiation. And a core part of masculine initiation is, and tribe, is accountability. We need brothers to hold us accountable. Um, I'll give you just a real quick story of this. Um, a couple years ago, I joined a men's program. Uh, I, I, I lived in Mexico, married for the third time, raising kids again. Um, my family only speaks Spanish. You know, five years ago, I, I could order in Spanish. That was about it. And I was, I was kind of isolated. So I, I went out looking and I found a men's program. I've been in for two years now. And it really stresses uh, this dynamic of accountability. And if any of you here want to change something in your life, um, and, and we can d dive deeper into this this weekend as well, I believe you need certain things to change anything in your life. I think, first of all, you, you, you need a plan. You need a direction that you're going. You need some, uh, uh, some structures to help get you there, some containers that you build for yourself. You need some support systems. You need, and in those support systems, you have accountability. And you need practices, daily practices that make this thing you want to learn or change start to feel normal to your nervous system. Right? So we can, we can dive more into that model. But I'll give you an example of the accountability, this men's program that I'm in. I mean, I, 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 I'm, always, I'm always working on myself. And one of the other things I really want to share with you over the weekend is that my personal belief is that whatever we want to call it, if we're calling it personal recovery, personal growth, um, whatever name we're giving to our transformation process, I don't believe that's about becoming a different person or a better person. I think it's about becoming more us, becoming more of who we are, and hopefully the best version of ourselves. To do that, we need accountability because we do get lazy, we do get distracted, we do get overwhelmed. So we need accountability. So one of the things I found is, like I so said, when I was sick two years ago, um, I was, for about three months, I, I, I just could do nothing. Uh, I lost over 30 pounds, had no energy, was sleeping a lot. Finally, a doctor in Mexico found that I had uh, a tumor blocking my small intestine. He did surgery, left me a nice little scar right here. I woke up from uh, surgery looking at the ceiling and going, number one, I'm alive. Number two, I'm back. I'm back. I felt alive again. But because then I couldn't, I couldn't do exercises in for about another three months because you know, I, I had staples in my small intestine, sutures, and I got out of the habit of exercising. Now, I've got, Mark's been to my house. I've got a gym in my house, right? I got free weights. I got a spin cycle. I got dumbbells. I got kettlebells. I got a TRX. I got a swimming pool. You know, I got no excuses for not exercising. And to top it off, my wife is a gym rat. She goes to exercise class every morning, and either before class or after, she's in the gym doing squats, working out, going up the, our stairs with 45-pound dumbbells on her, or, bar, or plates on her back. So, you know, and then I'm, I'm kind of, you know, this kind of getting flabby and lazy guy. And, and I knew, I, I, I just kept making promises to keep exercising, and it wasn't happening. So. I reached out to the men in my men's program and I said, I need accountability. Would anybody like to form an exercise accountability group with me? And two other guys did. One guy in Phoenix, Arizona, one guy in London. And that was over a year ago. And we still check in with each other every day. And we say, what is my commitment for exercise today? And then we check back in. Did we follow through on it or not? And I tell you what, that got me off my ass because I hate to report back to these guys. Yeah, I said I was going to do the spin cycle for 30 minutes today, but I got distracted and took a nap instead. I don't want to have to tell them that. I will, if it's the truth, I'll tell them that. And sometimes we even, um, we, we make ourselves put a, kind of a, a, a consequence, like contributing $100 to the reelection campaign of somebody that you could not stand to be president one more time. <laughs> That'll get you into the gym to do your exercise, right? And between the guy in Britain and me here in the US, you know, we both have people we don't like that are in the ruling parties. So accountability helps us get past our own inertia, laziness, distraction. So it's huge, all right? Has this already helped a little bit? Oh, yeah. You gotta have other, you gotta have brothers helping you. Don't, you, if, you, if you're struggling to get it done on your own, 
You got to have brothers help you. The same thing fits. I, I gave a talk on commitment um, a couple years, two, three years ago. I just had gotten married again. And um, kind of the theme of my talk on commitment that commitment only applies to things that don't come easy or naturally. We only make commitments to shit that we don't just get up and do every day on its own. So a commitment means we're, 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 we're saying, hey, this is important to me. It doesn't come easily. I see the value in it. And so I'm making it a priority and I'm speaking it publicly. This is a commitment. And to hold your commitments, you need accountability. Doing it on your own, you'll slip back into your own bullshit. So accountability is huge. Okay. Yeah, you can see the things I, I get fired up about. Okay, a couple other hands. Well, why, why you came this weekend? In the back and then up front. So, okay. uh, to Sean. To constantly be in my uh, abundance mindset. Abundance? Yeah, abundance. Abundance. Whew. That is one of my all-time favorite subjects. Abundance. And my think... Is that too many bees? I believe in abundance. It's on camera too. Okay, abundance. Uh, in my practices around abundance, I also stole from 12-step program. Okay, up here. To learn to get out of my head. To get out of your head? Anybody else <laughs> struggle with getting out of your head? Uh. Tony and I had a good discussion over lunch. He, 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 he went and had lunch with my wife and I. And um, she doesn't speak English. And um, she was giving him advice uh, on, on you know, changing his internal thinking and the movies and stories that play in his head. I'm just going, yeah, this is a wise woman. So he, he got bilingual advice for getting out of his head. So getting out of head, getting out of our heads. And I, I've really already enjoyed just a short time here, um, listening to Brian talk, um, some, of the, some of the other speakers. I can tell that there's, there's a strong influence of mindfulness. You know, when you hear somebody talking about, just start to notice thought as the clouds floating. Oh, there's another one. Here's another one. And then noticing the space in between, the blue sky, the nothingness, the no chatter. And um, I, I would say that, you know, when people ask me, what is, what's been the most recent thing that I've kind of been working around or teaching or kind of diving into? It has probably been around mindfulness and, and learning to do just that, just to be still and quiet enough just to notice thinking as it goes through and to know that it is just thoughts, it's not reality. And, and to be able to, to distinguish between that. Um, Tony's a certified coach with me in my program, and Mark is as well. And um, they know I teach a course called Ruminating Brain. And this has been really a big breakthrough for me to understand um, the dynamic of uh, if you have a brain that's just like a washing machine that spins all the time, re rehashing the past, past mistakes, missed opportunities, creating revisionist histories. If I'd only done this, if I'd not broken up with that woman, or if I'd talked to that woman, or if I'd not left that job, how my life would be different, or projecting into the future, trying to manage every possible outcome and trying to get it right before you take action, or constant judging and measuring of yourself where you're not good enough and everybody else can see that and know it, and, and just spinning about that all the time. So I, I teach a course on that, and, and so I'd be happy to share some of the concepts that I teach in there about getting out of our heads that are a combination of both mindfulness and cognitive behavioral therapy. But the core theme of that course, and, and while we're having lunch, Tony said, so doc, so what do I do with this? And I said the same thing I tell everybody, practice being the observer, not the believer. And we, but we guys, we want more, right? We, we want a tool, we want this. <clears throat> practice being the observer, not the believer. Our thoughts are just stories, they're just noise, they're just projections, they're just, our thinkers think because that's what thinkers do. And we get to practice just watching the thinker rather than following it everywhere it goes. Okay, there's another hand over here. Raul, is that you? Uh, there's something that 
chapter five that kind of disturbs me. Like I can't go to sleep because of it. But I think it has, it's in the middle of it. I'm thinking it has to be in the middle of what? Chapter five. Of what? No, never ask me about something that's in a certain chapter or a certain page because I don't remember where everything ended up. But but clue me into what it was about. And then you talk somewhere halfway in between, like about the father, like uh, something of a father, like if a child sees the father, and then it, I just can't nail it down. Do you have a copy of my book with you? No, I do. Oh, yeah. Get with him later. And, and revisit the question when, when, you, when you got exactly what you want. I'll be here two more days. So I'd be, I'd be happy to field more questions. How do you know if the relationship you're in with a woman, you know what? You, know you know is one sentence. One. How, do you know <laughs> How do you know? Okay. Evaluating. Okay, this, this is actually a pretty good weekend's worth of stuff. Anybody else got anything you want to add to why you came here that, that it would make it worth all your time and expense and effort to have this thing kind of better grasp of it when you leave? Confidence. Pardon? Confidence. Confidence. I like that subject too. Um, I'm, not, I'm not a big believer in it in the traditional sense. A lot of the stuff I say is going to seem counterintuitive or paradoxical because everything that's intuitive to us men kind of just keeps us getting the same shit we've always gotten in our life because it's intuitive but it's not actually correct so confidence so since you were so brief in one word rather than two sentences can you give me a um, context of where you would like to be more confident in both Relationships and business. Okay. Are you in a relationship? No. You want to be in one? I was separated from my wife for getting divorced, and I'm, that was two years ago. I'm just now getting into uh, thinking about relationships. Okay. Relationships. Business. Okay. This is what's going to get us started today. Okay, one more, go ahead. Um, I was curious about how you became self-aware of the nice guy and how you differentiated uh, giving value rather than covert contracts or something like that. All right. And like being able to differentiate where it's coming from a healthy place and from an unhealthy place. Good question. It's a very good question. Probably if I use shorter words, I'd have fewer spelling problems, but <laughs> codependency versus healthy interdependence. Okay? We could also call this differentiated state versus fused state, or borrowed functioning versus... So there's a lot of terms we can give it, but it's, in fact, I think I'll dive in a little bit. Uh, that's what maybe I'll, I'll start us off with. Okay? Your thoughts on getting over insecurities? Getting over insecurities. I'm also not a big believer in the concept of insecurities. <laughs> yes, we're going to talk about them in terms that I've already heard used already today in self-limiting beliefs. That, that's how we'll, we'll, we'll use it. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. <sighs> All right, I'm ready for a break. Um, <laughs> Okay, let me tell you just a little bit about my personal story and, and, um, and then kind of wind it into a little bit around the codependency and healthy interdependence. And, um, and then maybe, a, we'll, 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 you know, Mark talks about having, what do you say, a loving king be the? 
The benevolent king. Benevolent king? All right, this is a benevolent dictatorship when I'm up here, all right? I'm going to give you guys a voice in a lot of stuff, but I'm the decider. I, 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 I'll be the final say on it. So let me tell you just a little bit about my story. Um, I, I mentioned that I was a minister. I grew up in a fundamental Christian church. Um, grew up with a father that was angry, critical, but had a lot of good traits as well. Um, I, I, I loved my dad. I liked spending time with him. Uh, he played ball with me. He was always out throwing balls to me, pitching to me, coming to my practices. We went camping and fishing, but, but he was moody and he was critical. And, and he had these depressive states that could go on forever and just would criticize. Um, also very demanding, very demanding of my mother. Um, my mother was a codependent. You know, didn't want anybody to be unhappy. She didn't handle conflict well. Uh, I have a lot of her temperament. She taught me to be different from my father. She, as, as a boy, she said, I'm, I'm, I'm raising you and your brother to be different from your father. Now, bless her soul, she apologized for that a few years back. She said that wasn't a good thing to tell you or a good thing to do, to try to raise you to be different from your father. Um, so I, I grew up kind of following my mom's modeling. I was always there to kind of take care of mom, so I learned to kind of be codependent with her. I'd listen to her talk about her problems. I'd be her little companion. I'd be different from my father. Um, tried never to be angry or critical or demeaning like my dad. And uh, lo and behold, <laughs> I'm more like him than different than him. I can be as critical and judgmental as hell. Um, but those are just thoughts that I get to watch. Um, so I, I grew, with that family, and my fundamental Christian upbringing that, you know, that if, if you don't, if you commit a sin, whether you know it or not, and if you don't ask for forgiveness and end your prayer in Jesus' name, amen, before you die, you're going to hell for all eternity. Right? That, that, that's the level of, of harshness and judgmentalness that I grew up with. So, man, I, I got to be good. I, I got to be a good guy. So I, I grew up trying to be different. You know, and then I grew up in the 60s and 70s. I'm 64 today. Sam, how old are you? 63. 63. Anybody else in their late 50s, early 60s here? You, you're not even 50 yet, are you? 56. All right. 56. So we grew up during an environment in the 60s and 70s where, where radical feminism, you know, there, there was the healthy part of feminism that said, you know, equal pay for equal work, equal opportunity, all that stuff. But there were some really angry aspects of it and uh, lashing out at men and the patriarchy. You hear it, 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 we're actually going through another phase of it right now. Um, where it's is really pronounced again with the toxic masculine and everything men do is toxic masculine, all that kind of stuff. I grew up hearing things like um, every man's a rapist, um, an erection's a sign of aggression, uh, a woman needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle. Uh, Gloria Steinem, who said that, went on to marry a very wealthy man. Go figure. Um, but I grew up hearing that stuff during a very impressionable age. I didn't realize too much later, most of that was a bunch of pissed off, angry lesbians. I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to be dismissive, but it wasn't, it wasn't women in general. But because they had the loudest voices, I, I, it made an impression because I was already pointed in that direction anyway. Don't be that bad man. Then, of course, when, when you start getting around women, young women who are inherently shitty at relationship and repeatedly get done to by men and guess what they want to talk about their yeah their shitty relationships and how they've been victimized and this guy did that and that guy's doing this and as a nice guy what do you do listen. you listen and you try to be the opposite of uh, opposite of crazy is crazy i won't be that bad man that i hear women complain about, right so you as somebody's mentioned, we repress our, our sexual intent, which, as we've heard defined, is creepy. When you repress your sexual intent, by the way, approach, where is it? Oh, it's way up there. Approach, which I don't believe in. Um, I do in context. I'll give you the context. Approach. Guys, and there's women in here that can validate it, go ask them. When you approach a woman and start talking to her out of the blue, she knows why you're talking to her. Because you're hoping you'll get to see her tits. 
Am I right? You women know that's why we talk to you. We don't talk to you because we think you're the most interesting creatures on the planet and we want to have a highly stimulating intellectual conversation. <laughs> women know that. You don't have to hide it. But we nice guys, I don't want to be that jerk that the women complain about. So I'll hide everything that I heard the women complain about. That was me. Right. On top of that, I went to a Christian college where they would kick you out of school if you got caught drinking or having sex. And, and so like all this was deeply ingrained in me. So when I did date, which I wasn't very good at, and we'll talk more about that I'm sure this weekend around dating skills, um, my approach, and I now call it nice guy seduction, is that you know, if there's a woman that you know, was not too bad looking, but not too good looking, you know, not, not too fat, but you know, okay, maybe she'd want to go out with me. I, I'd sit next to her in class or as close as I could get. Wouldn't talk to her per se, but just, you know, try to impress her by knowing the answers the teacher, the professor asked. Like, that's real impressive to women. They want to get naked to, with a guy that knows, you know, all the answers to the professor. It's just in their DNA. They can't help it. It, it actually doesn't work for shit. Um, <laughs> My other strategy uh, when I was in college is we had to go to chapel every day and were required to go to church on Sundays. And they had this large auditorium with like theater seats in it, really big auditorium. My, my dating strategy was I'd go early, you know, kind of get a row that nobody was sitting on, and I'd go sit on the, like the second seat from the end and leave one open thinking this is great pickup strategy, right? That was before pickup was invented. But um, no, really, I'm not making that up. <laughs> and it's terrible pickup strategy. And thinking, I'll leave this seat empty and some woman will come walking along by herself, see an empty seat and think, oh, I want to sit next to that guy. Anyone want to take bets on how well that worked? <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Two things I didn't take into consideration. Women never go to church or chapel by themselves. They go with a girlfriend if, they, if they're, you know, whatever. So they're, they have a girlfriend or two. So there's only one seat there. They're not going to sit there. The other thing is they see an empty seat next to a guy. What do they think? He's saving it for whoever's coming to sit by him. It's terrible, terrible. But that was, those, you know, I had no other strategy. Right? So all this nice guy stuff. And when I did get a woman, I, I hung on for fucking ever. You know, I've got this woman, I, I don't want to lose her. I, I mean, she may not be great. I, 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 I now say I, I was married for 25 years to my first two wives. I should not have dated either one over three dates. That, I'm not making that up. They're, they're both are good people with good qualities. But by the third date, I, I now know enough, know what to look for. I, there was enough signs. I should not date either one. I was married to one over 10 years and one over 14 years. So, because I was such a, a bad dater, I, I, I was a bad ender. I'd stay way too long and put up with way too much and just give and try to make everything better. Okay, bring it forward. I was in my second marriage, and um, about two years in, uh, I acted out inappropriately. Now, my second wife and I had an affair. I was the minister. This gets good, juicy, right? Like I said, my book's a chronicle of my fuck-ups. I was a minister. She was a member of my congregation. We were both married. She seduced me. I later found out she'd had multiple affairs in her marriage, and she was only 26 when I met her. So we got together, and on our honeymoon, she said, aren't you glad that now that we're married, we don't have to pretend to like sex anymore? <laughs> I wasn't pretending. <laughs> she was the hottest woman I'd ever seen, and I couldn't believe she wanted to be with me. And now she's saying, hey, we don't have to pretend anymore. I'm going, wait a minute. But I was such a nice guy. It's like, oh, I'll, 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 I, I knew she'd quit having sex with her husband. I, I, but I'm, I'm different. I'll, 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 we'll get through this. She'll want to have sex with me because I'm good. And um, she didn't <laughs> for 14 years. And um, so about two years in the relationship, I had an inappropriate relationship for about a month, walked away from it, and about a year later, that person told my ex-wife. Why to this day, I don't know. So as you imagine, that created a little bit of an emotional storm. And um, my second wife said, you need to get help. She said, you think you're such a nice guy. Everybody thinks you're a nice guy. You treat me like a nice guy, and then out of the blue, you do these things that are really hurtful to me. And she said, I'd rather be with a jerk. At least with a jerk, I know he's going to be a jerk. I know he's going to hurt me. With you, I think everything's good, and you do these very hurtful things. You need to go get help. 
So I, I went to get help. I joined a 12-step group. I got some therapy, all with the idea of trying to find out why my being a nice guy didn't make my ex treat me better. Why wasn't she ever happy? Why, why was she angry all the time? Why didn't she want to have sex anymore? Being a nice guy was supposed to work. Now, I was a marriage therapist at this time, and I started noticing as I was asking myself these questions in therapy, luckily I got into good therapy and started finding out about boundaries and shame, which we'll talk about, and making my needs a priority and being honest and transparent. I started learning good stuff, luckily. But I started noticing men coming to therapy with their girlfriends or wives saying the exact same things I was saying. I'm a nice guy, I treat her better than her ex, I'm raising her kids, I'll do anything to make her happy, it's never good enough, she's never happy, she never wants to have sex anymore, when's it gonna be my turn? And then there were the single guys saying, you know, I treat women well, I'm not one of the jerks, I listen to them talk about their problems, you know, I, I, I pay their car payments, I help them move, you know, and all they can say to me is, someday some woman's gonna be really lucky to have you. And these guys are saying, why doesn't she want me? She thinks I'm such a great catch. Why doesn't she want me? And so, you know, all these men like me were perplexed. Why wasn't this working? Why weren't especially women responding more positively to us being the kind of guys we've heard all our lives women want us to be? So I started going, hmm, I do that a lot. Hmm, what's that about? So I, I, I started a No More Mr. Nice Guy men's group. We met every other week. And I just started writing lessons. Nowadays, we probably call them blogs. Just writing articles, that I, stuff I was finding out about me, how we became nice guys, culturally how we get indoctrinated, familial, how, how that happens to us, um, what doesn't work, what works better. And guys kept saying, you need to write a book. You, know, you need to go on Oprah. You could have a bestseller. So for about six or seven years of writing, and about three years to get it published, it came out about seven, 16, 17 years ago, early 2003. And I'm just boggled that the majority of you here, as it's so amazing, have, have read that book. And it is now, you know, it's worldwide affecting people. And I, th I think there is a worldwide men's movement. Um, we don't know that, but I think that's what's happening. I just have to say the music has gotten louder and kind of distracting, but I'll push through it. I'm going to hold the frame. <laughs> I'm going to ground myself. I'm going to breathe. <sighs> I'll be fine. It'd be better if it wasn't shitty music. But just, let's just go dance, man. Let's just go with it. So, so that's where No More Mr. Nice Guy came from. So to bring it back to the question, one of the things that I, I tell people that I think all self-help, all religion, all mindfulness, whenever we're, we're like helping people like change paradigms, like old roadmaps that we thought this is how the world works and how I fit into it and how I get my needs met and get love and things like that. Whenever we start shifting people's paradigms, we need to tell them it's going to take a while to integrate a new roadmap. All right? It's going to take a while. That, that's why when you go to a 12-step program, they've got the new roadmap for you. And they, they, they got sponsors and they got meetings and you go and you talk and there's people there that are further along the road and have more experience. And that's how you get help integrating a new roadmap. Because what happens, and, and by the way, when you start shifting radically a roadmap, which at some point in life probably most of us need to, until we get that new one integrated, there's a lot of questions. So back, back, kind of back to the question of the difference between codependency and a healthy interdependence. An example I often give when you start doing your, your nice guy work is you go, okay, um, I, I don't want to be a nice guy. I, I don't want to use my covert contracts. Let me just throw those three, three covert contracts nice guys use. Um, and almost every nice guy operates at some level with each of these three. Covert contract number one is that if I'm a good guy, I'll be liked and loved. And women will want to fuck me. And by the way, there, there's, I've heard a lot of, if you start, if you, if you just kind of put no more Mr. Nice Guy into Google search in terms, so you get like an email whenever the term no more Mr. Nice Guy or Nice Guy gets used, more and more there's articles in popular media, mainly about women writing about these nice guys that have this agenda and expectation because they've been nice to you, you should want to be their girlfriend or have sex. And, and, and those nice guys are not so nice. That's a manipulative thing to think, I'm good, I'm nice to you, now you got, you're supposed to put out for me. 
And nice guys often are not so nice. We, we get these resentments built up, we get passive aggressive, we have victim pukes. Um, and, and so, yeah, we're not so nice. A lot of the, the, the men going their own way thing that Mark mentioned, uh, incels, involuntary celibates, a lot of these men are really pissed off at women because they've been following this nice guy covert contract that if I'm just a good guy and I'm the guy that I've been hearing women say they want from a man, I do that, how come none of them ever look at me, never want to talk to me, don't want to take their clothes off for me? And, and we get pissed off because we think we've kept our end of the deal. Right? So that's covert contract number one. If I'm a good guy, I'll be liked and loved. Now, a few problems with that is none of us are, you know, that good all the time. And not everybody's going to like or love us. But we believe the covert contract should work. They're all this if-then giving to get. Covert contract number two, if I meet everyone else's needs without them having to ask, then they will meet my needs without me having to ask. Now, this is a really kind of screwed up covert contract. You know, we're given to other people codependency um, because we want them to like us. We want them not to be unhappy or we don't want, we want them not to be mad. So we give to them what we need to give, not what they need to receive. And oftentimes codependency, it does typically two things. And codependency is just another way of saying nice guy, all right, is we don't believe we're good enough as we are. So, but if we give to other people, they'll like us and give back to us, all right? But, but the two, two big problems with this covert contract of giving what we think other people need is number one, we attract needy people, right? Broken people. Kind of in red pill community, they call it Captain save -a You know, I, the, this woman's needy and broken. She's a poor single mom. I, I can fix that. I can rescue her. Um, so you either attract broken people that are shitty at giving because their lives are usually such a mess, they got nothing left to give, right? Or the other thing that we do is, is that in being codependent with people, we rob them of the opportunity to be sufficient in them, their own selves, to figure their own stuff out, to, to get things taken care of on their own. So we actually make people dependent, right? Which is not healthy. Co and by the way, these people, when we have this covert contract, uh, you know, I'll meet your needs without you having to ask, you'll meet mine without me having to ask. Another big problem is nobody knows the contract exists. They're covert. So, you know, the women we're talking to, the woman we're in relationship with, our coworker, our boss, they don't know that we're given all this stuff to, so that they'll give back to us without us ever even saying what we want back. Now, another core problem with this is that nice guys are really shitty receivers. How many people are comfortable receiving with people giving you nice things, doing nice, not a lot of hands going up. Most of us have had to work at it, right? For most of us, it makes us uncomfortable when somebody gives us a compliment or tells us something nice about ourselves or wants to do something for us. Um, when I got, got divorced and started dating, <laughs> this is a true story, but it's, my, it's how my perverted mind works. Um, my second wife, like I said, we did not have much sex. And um, I, 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 I'll just be blatant. blatant. Um, she, she would have nothing to do with my penis. She wouldn't touch my penis, wouldn't go down on me, blah, 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 blah. So when I got out there in the dating world, I met women that, you know, were eager to go down on me. You know, they, they took pride in their blowjobs. And I actually had a hard time receiving. And it dawned on me that I thought, who was I to deprive these women of the great joy <laughs> of giving me an amazing blowjob? I, this is, I know it sounds so silly, I had to consciously work and relax and let myself go and let women give to me, right? I give that example because, you know, it gets men's attention. But most of us are not good at receiving, so which is another reason why that giving to get doesn't actually work out very well. Third covert contract. If I do everything right, then I will have a smooth problem-free life. Now, several problems with this covert contract. Number one, we're never going to do everything right. I mean, and where is the rule book that tells us how to do everything right? Now, I know a few of them have been presented to us over the centuries. Here's the rule book, but every one of those rule books also says nobody ever gets it right. The, the, the very rule books say that. Okay. So what's the rule book that says how to get it right? And we don't live in a smooth, problem-free world. 
We live in a chaotic, ever-changing world. That's the beauty of it. So these covert contracts do not work at all. So let's say you decide to start challenging your codependency and covert contracts. This is the adjustment in paradigm. So you're, 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 you know, you're walking, you know, any, any big city like this, and you're, you're walking up to an office building like some big double glass doors, and you start to open a door, and you notice somebody walking up the steps behind you. And as you turn and look, it's a young, let's say, a young woman, a young, attractive woman, all right? And without, you, you hold the door and let her walk through. She smiles, and you go on through. And your brain goes, oh, fuck. Was that me being a nice guy? Did I just do it again? Okay, these are the kind of internal struggles you will have around any change of paradigm. You're gonna second guess everything you do. Was that me being a nice guy because I wanted her approval, I want her to smile at me, I want her to notice, or was I just being a decent human being holding the door open for another human being? You don't know, okay? Which is gonna bring us up to fear and shame and anxiety. We'll weave this in, if not today, soon. Most of the ways, I'll just give you the guys a little clue here. When you're changing a paradigm, most of the paradigms we've been operating by since childhood that we internalized at a very, very early age, before our thinking brain prefrontal cortex was at all wired up. We stored everything in an emotional part of our brain called the amygdala. We store every experience we have um, at an emotional level at a very early age. And as Mark mentioned, children are narcissi narcissistic. They have a huge fear of abandonment. That was us. We were little babies. We, we were totally dependent, helpless, um, needy, and, and living in our emotional brain. Right? So everything happened to us. And, and I think sometime this weekend, I'll diagram this even further. We'll go even deeper into it. Got stored up in our, in our emotional brain, for good or for bad. And then the emotional brain is wired into our thinking brain. So uh, down here in the brain stem, where that emotional brain is, the amygdala, which is about the size of your little fingernail, is wired into every other part of your brain and influences every other part. And the amygdala is wired into all your sensory perceptors, sight, smell, hearing, taste, touch, and, and it experiences things before your, your, your thinking brain does. Okay, so when we're little children, we have experiences that are fearful, that are frightening, they're scary, we're, we're helpless. Right? We have, and, and these typically trigger some degree of anxiety because we are helpless and we are dependent and we are afraid of abandonment. And they tr get internalized as shame. Children internalize when bad things happen to them, going back to that narcissistic self of the child, that I caused that. There's something wrong with me. I, I must be bad because mom cries. I must be bad because dad gets angry. I must be bad because mom and dad are fighting. Children always internalize that, that fear, that anxiety, that shame. And then what we do is we create two, two survival me mechanisms. One is to try to manage the uncomfortable feelings we're feeling in that moment. Maybe as babies we start sucking our thumbs. I did. I sucked my thumb till I was in kindergarten. That must mean something. Right? I was managing something. Maybe babies eat a bunch. Maybe they quit eating. Maybe they cry. Maybe they sleep a lot. Maybe they fuss a lot. Maybe they become pleasers. Maybe they become rebellers. You know, whatever, it's all a non-thought out process. It's an emotional process from a primitive, immature brain trying to figure out how do I not, how do I not feel bad? How do I not, we don't name this shit because we can't think it, but how do I not feel the fear, the anxiety, the, the, the shame that I'm bad? So we develop that survival mechanism. The second we develop is one to try to prevent these painful things from happening in the future. Right? So if I just do this or don't do this, then these things won't happen again and better things will happen, which that's a whole nice guy syndrome. If I just become this, then I'll get love and approval and get my needs met. Or if I just hide this from people, I won't get rejected or they won't be disgusted in me. Okay? So, to answer the question of how do you know the difference between your old codependent acting out or just healthy independence, like you open the door, was that codependency, she's going to like me, covert contract, or was that just, hey, we're two human beings, go ahead. The main thing to pay attention to is your internal states around fear, anxiety, and shame. And, and one thing, just you know, from what I've been hearing so far, just today, 
a lot of the work being done in this program is around paying attention to these feeling states, to these emotional states. You know, whether we're paying attention in our body, whether we're paying attention to other manifestations of them. If we can start paying attention, because every one, codependency is one of those things we developed as kids, as, as babies, to try to manage our uncomfortable feelings and to try to ensure our survival, that we'll get our needs met, we'll be connected, we'll be valued, we won't starve to death, we won't get thrown in a ditch, we won't be, you know, whatever the fear is. So, this process is a slow, gradual process. That's why, you know, every one of us goes to a workshop expecting good things, we get excited, and then we think, yeah, I got, I got the plan, I got the method, I got the understanding now, and then two weeks later, we're kind of all back in our old routines and patterns. That's real normal, because that's the, all of our old survival mechanisms are wired into a really, really deep part of our brain. And we may never, ever get access to everything. But we won't get access. It doesn't have picture memory. It doesn't have word memory. It just has feeling memory. And again, that's why I really like an emphasis in this program is pay attention to your feelings. They're important information. They're directing you to, to things that are churning. You know, the body's connected to the mind, and the mind's connected to the body. And all of that's interrelated. So whatever you feel is typically telling an old story. It's usually not telling a story about right now. Right now just triggered something old that got brought into the present. So as we start getting clarity around what are our typical codependent behaviors, and then we can start paying attention when we have the impulse to act codependently, all right, am I in a fearful place? Am I, I don't have anxiety written here, but it's another real big piece of it. Or am I shame-based place? I want to be approved of. I want to be liked. I don't want to be rejected. I, I, I need somebody's external validation. So I don't remember if that was you that kind of, somebody up here asked, how do we know that difference? What did you call it? What were the other names that you called it? Fusion and differentiation. Differentiation, technical term, is the ability, it's got two, two parts to it. One is the ability to ask yourself, what do you want? What's important to you? What feels right? Now, children cannot do that. We don't live in a culture that encourages children to do that. We live in cultures where children are encouraged to do what mom and dad tell them to do. We don't encourage little kids to say, what do you want? What feels right to you? What do you value? What's most important to you? You know, for little kids, it's, I want to put my shoes on myself. And for the big people, say, no, that takes too long. We're going to put them on for you. So we, we don't value differentiation. Right? The, the, uh, okay, part one of differentiation is the ability to ask yourself, what do you want? What's important to you? Part two of differentiation is the ability to follow through on that when either you're dealing with resistance outside of you, kind of all the change back messages, or don't act that way, don't be that way, or, you know, our, our family, our people don't act that way, you know, all that message or the noise between your ears in the terms of neurotic guilt and anxiety that says, oh, if I truly act in ways that I value that are important to me, um, people, people will react negatively, or I'll get in trouble, or I'll, I'll fail and crash and burn, and I'll be a loser. That noise is always going on. And I've, again, I've heard a lot of talk about listening to that inner thought talk. So to be differentiated means you can ask yourself, what's important to me? What do I want? And then follow through on that. That's a mature, trustworthy adult. That's somebody that you can go to the bank on because they've asked themselves, what do I believe to be true? What's important to me? And then they can follow through even with the resistance to do it. That's differentiation. That's, that's a healthy, interdependent human being. The fused state is where maybe, yeah, there's a few people on the right. You might watch a Star Trek Next Generation, the Borg, where you get assimilated into the Borg. Fusion is that. You give up you and your identity for the sake of the, you know, the Borg, the whole, and the, there's no more individual self. And then, the, then you're like, just exist as part of, you know, the Borg. That's fusion. That's what happens in our family, happens in church, happens in culture. That, no, you've got to do it our way. You've got to be part of us. We don't do it that way. And, and that can be challenging in a lot of families and cultures to overcome. Again, that's why we need support systems and accountability and practices. So I'm going to be a broken record around those themes this weekend. Okay, I know I'm just kind of you know doing a big shotgun approach, but any other questions about just in general what is codependency, um, fused state, borrowed functioning, um, and application? Like I said, read the book on how 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 to overcome it. <laughs> um,
But other questions about that? Or, or even like the, the fear and shame and anxiety? You know, how to let go of these things? We gotta be willing to, to honor them and let go of them. So we've gotta be able to observe them. Again, I like the emphasis of this workshop is learning to pay attention to the feeling states in your body. Tony, I always love your questions. Uh, are, you, are you worried about uh, soiling your really white pants ever? Yeah, I am. Why do you ask? <laughs> just, they're very white. I'm just curious. <laughs> no, yeah. I have a real All right. I'm, 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 I'm going to be really brutally honest with you. Um, Tw 25 years ago, nobody would have ever accused me of being authentic. I try to be authentic. All right. So since you asked, I have a hemorrhoid. And I got on white underwear and white pants and it got me thinking, oh no. So I actually stuck a little bit extra toilet paper in the back of my white underwear. You didn't even know that, did you? But thank you for asking. <laughs> that, that, that's just not lunch conversation, right? Yeah, it, it's, it's crossed my mind more than once today. Thank you for asking. That's why I always call on you, Tony. I'm, uh, my real question, though, is uh, I'm glad you brought up the example. The example you gave when you like go to hold the door for a young attractive. Well, oh, I thought you were going to bring up the example of letting a woman give me the blowjob. Uh, <laughs> Holding uh, the door. Okay. The example that you gave when you go to hold the woman, uh, hold the door for a young attractive woman. All right. Cl cl clarify your thinking. Ground yourself. Breathe. So, like a lot of my clients ask the same question. They overthink everything they do. Yeah. They second guess everything they do. Let's see. We've got that up here, don't we? Yeah. Uh, where, where's it in our heads? Uh, so a lot of my clients ask very, and I always, my answer is, and I don't know if this is the right answer, so I guess I'm asking if this is the right answer, but I always say, well, you know, the only time it's a problem is if you're, there's nothing wrong with being a nice person. Yes. The only time it's a problem is when you're operating under some sort of covert contract. So yeah. you ask yourself, am I doing this out of the goodness of my heart or not? Yeah, and that's a, that's a really simple way to approach it because we do overthink it. And, and, and it, that's why it's good. I'll go back to the 12-step model. That's why like a recovering alcoholic has somebody that, you know, they've just been recovering for three weeks. You got somebody who's been recovering for 30 years. And they've, they've overthought everything over the last 30 years and got some clarity, right? And they can help the person that's just three weeks in get clarity quicker, right? So we don't have to, you know, think this out forever. But yeah, if you pay attention to, to your states, fear states, anxiety states, shame states, and for example, you do something for somebody and you think, well, I just did it because I, want, I wanted to, right? Not because I have an agenda or a covert contract. But notice, if they don't approve of you, if they don't validate you, if they don't thank you, how do you feel? Example, you're, you're, you're in traffic and it's heavy traffic and you see somebody waiting to pull in. And so you give them a little bit of space and you let that car pull in in front of you. Just being a decent human being, right? But what if they don't give you the wave? You ever go, Fucking asshole. <laughs> that was a covert contract, right? I let him in. He didn't fucking give me the wave. <laughs> That's how you know. If you feel at all resentful, done to, um, eh, any of that stuff, it's, it's probably a covert contract. So, but this, and this does take a lot of work. How do we get clarity of just being a loving, generous, giving human being without there being strings attached. It does take practice. I'm still working on it. I, I, I've been working on this stuff for 25 years. I'll still find myself giving, you know, wanting to be approved of and wanting to be thanked for it, wanting to be noticed. I still do it. So I just, I've learned to watch it. I've been at it long enough to learn to watch it. Okay, there's another question kind of up here. In, okay, and then probably we're getting pretty close to wrapping it up. But okay, what do you got? I just wanted you to elaborate more on uh, healthy interdependence. Healthy interdependence is, yeah, we could go uh, into this quite a bit. Um, we need each other, okay? We're, we are tribal by nature. As humans, we, we're, we are slow, we're not particularly strong. We sleep at night when predators prowl. 
Um, our babies are helpless for years. Right? We, our, the odds are not in our favor to survive in, in this evolutionary world. Guess how we survived and, and grew, grew to be the biggest dumbasses on the planet? We cooperated. We worked together. That, that we had a healthy interdependence, whether it was the men going out and providing, protecting, uh, the, the women looking after offspring. We all do what everybody could do for the benefit of the tribe and, and get ahead. Um, we, we men are too slow to run down uh, most animals for food. But guess what, what you can do with a group of men? You, you can spread out and you can just keep jogging until, you know, chasing an animal until it does its sprint, and its fight flight, you know, mechanism, and it eventually gets tired. And if there's enough men out there that are just jogging along, moving it or that animal around, it finally just drops of exhaustion. Cooperation makes that happen. So we need that healthy interdependence. And let me just say one thing, and then probably this is a good place to wrap it up, because most of us are here because we got issues around women, right? We, we, we kind of all want a good relationship with a woman. Part of the problem we run into, and, and tomorrow I'd love to talk more about fusion and differentiation in very practical terms, not just theoretical. Because we grew up, we evolved for two million years, say, as humans in a tribal situation, we got all of our needs met communally. That included food, security, and sex. Best evidence is that our tribal forefathers and foremothers Fucked everybody. Everybody had sexual access. <laughs> there, there were no involuntary incels, no men going their own way. Everybody had, every, but, but that, that all changed about 10,000 years ago when we, when we became more stationary, started growing stuff, owning stuff, owning land, <laughs> trees, cows, wives, children, stuff like that. That all changed and we started owning, all right, your, your vagina is my, my vagina. Nobody else gets access to that. So everything changed. Now, fast forward to, to where we are modern day, we all still have all of those needs that the tribe used to meet for us. The tribe met the needs. And we still have the need for connection, the need for, for, for love, the need for sex, the need for, you know, all these experiences that used to be met tribal. So because the tribe's not meeting them now, guess where we go trying to find every one of those needs? Internet. <laughs> Why didn't I see that coming? Yeah, no. Well, with one woman, right? If I can just find this one woman who will meet all my needs for companionship, for love, for sex, for validation, for, you know, cooperation, for us, what, and, and, and we fuse with them. Like, you're, you are now my girlfriend, and she's thinking, you're now my boyfriend. So therefore, you should, you should, and now we create these fused, you should relationships, because you belong to me. And all of a sudden, we're not getting our needs met, and we'll talk more about this tomorrow, probably tomorrow will be a good time. We're not getting our needs met, and so we expect this one person to do it, and when they can't, we resent the hell out of them, and want to change them or trade them in for a different one. And they're doing the same thing to us because they bought into it too, that we should be able to meet all of their needs. That's what fusion does. And it's, it's trying to get a myriad of needs met in, in a, in, from just one person and it can't be done. So we'll just kind of leave that there and we'll talk more about how it can be done. So we'll, we'll, we'll leave you expecting a little bit. Here's my belief system. My belief system is that we are not wired for monogamy. That's not what evolution wired us to do. Um, but we live in a culture that, that monogamy is the expectation, okay? I believe that probably expecting, as men, expecting any relationship with a woman to ever live up to our expectations, it, it's never going to. Whatever the male brain thinks a woman can do for us is wrong. And conversely, whatever the female brain thinks a man can do for them, it's going to be wrong as well. So in some ways, it doesn't matter if, you, if as a guy we got eight women in our life or one woman, one woman, whatever our brain thinks they can do for us, it's still going to be wrong. So the way I look at it is that relationships are a challenge. If you're going to be polyamorous in a monogamous culture, it's going to be a challenge. If you're going to be monogamous when we're not wired for it, it's going to be a challenge. For me, that's why I say all dating, all relationships, whether they're monogamous, polyamorous, are powerful personal growth machines. If we approach the work consciously, it's going to inform us about us. 
and it's going to challenge us and it's going to grow us if we're conscious. So in some ways it doesn't matter if we're being monogamous or polyamorous. It's still going to challenge. Polyamorous relationships have more fucking rules than monogamous relationships. They're challenging. We guys think, oh, I just get to fuck whoever I want. It ain't ever that simple. Okay? So it will challenge us. So I'm all in for the challenge. Dating, conscious dating is a challenge. Conscious relationships, monogamous, polyamorous, they're challenge. Okay, remember, it's a gift. These challenges, I bumbled my way through every relationship I've had. I had a PhD in marriage and family therapy at 29 years old. I'm on my third marriage. Right? I'm still bumbling my way through it. It's just not wired into us, but it's an amazing powerful personal growth machine. So whether we're being polyamorous, monogamous, um, we can use consciousness to make either one of them amazingly powerful.